Hi everyone, welcome to Type Talks. Today we have our lovely guest, Shannon from Objective Personality. For those who are new to OPS, how would you describe it to them? <laughs> right, oh, well, when we first got started, we we definitely started with the same, you know, Myers-Briggs typing and then quickly realized that it was more about the function. So that was like, it was like almost an immediate, like, okay, let's actually study Carl Jung and see what's going on there with the, just the formulation of the functions. And then, as soon as we started trying to actually track and come to the same type as each other, like, you know, do like double blind testings or whatever you would call that, but it's just two people in opposite rooms, not getting to influence each other. And having to do that was like level 10, the hardest thing I've ever had to do in my life took 15 years off the back of my life for sure. You know, um, trying to actually align in reality with someone else. We started really realizing so quickly that it, there was, a lot of differences, a lot of, you know, intricacies of each individual person that were showing up that we were not able to track with just the functions alone, not, you know, the 16 types we weren't able to track. And we started recognizing, okay, wait a minute, if this person's like, it started off, I think it was like, INTJs is like, if this person's an INTJ and that person's an INTJ, why are they like wildly different? Why do they have different reoccurring problems? You know, what's happening there? You can see the cognitive functions. You were able to see the, the function stack, but then it's just, you you know, two people are not able to consistently come to the same conclusion as the other. And that's when it just led us on an absolute rabbit hole of just that there are actual jumpers that you can have your top function and your third function as your saviors um, instead of just the top two, which is the norm, which is what most people think, you know, especially if you are a, a standard, if you have the top two, it's just like unbelievable that you would have your first and your third. Uh, so that started showing up. And then, you know, we started calling those pairings, you know, the, the animals, uh, we, ca we started calling them animals, which is just an observer and a decider working together. That's when we realized, okay, there's there's a whole system of things going on of people's energy connected to their animals and how people are reoccurringly behaving. So that game all started because we were attempting to get the same type and just couldn't. We just couldn't at first. It took us years. And every single year, it was like a new discovery of a new coin, you know, a binary coin. They either have this one or this one above the other. And each time we did that, we started getting more results, more results, more results, more results, and, you know, typing thousands of people. And once we finally started really getting all of the parts, it, it stopped at 512. Oh my God, thank God. Because it was just like, please, not another part to have to own, you know? It stopped at about 512, at 512. And that's when we started getting like okay, we're getting 70% the same. We're getting 80% the same. We're getting, and then it just became about honing in our biases and honing in our ability to interpret the person correctly. Because at that point now, it's just the person themselves is like, are we done yet? I don't really want to get into the person's reoccurring life. I don't really want to deeply listen. And the more that we honed in our own skills of being able to actually listen better, interpret better, that's when we would just, we're starting to get like 90% and above the same as each other over time, you know, took a lot of years and thousands of typings, thousands of hours, but that's when it stopped, <laughs> when it started getting reoccurringly consistent. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> I heard this study before with, or like the saying where you have to have like 10,000 hours in something to become an expert. So the same uh, thing is yeah. with like OP, you have to clock in those hours like you guys say. <laughs> yeah, so true. That's exactly what we were seeing as well. Like you don't want to believe it. When you first get started, you're just hoping that there's some kind of shortcut that you could, you know, okay, maybe they visually all look exactly the same. Oh, well, then they don't look exactly the same. Like they're just every single time we had one of these coins, the desire so much was that, can we shortcut this? Can we shortcut this? Can we... You know, of course, all along the way, I'm like, I know what we need to do. We need to be spending more time getting an AI to work, you know, like, <laughs> like that's all I wanted to do in the beginning years. And it just was like, all right, I got to put in my hours. I got to put in my time because if I don't know this at my core, then then what comes next? Like when we were typing people, it was so fast, like, OK, great. Now they have their type. Now what? You know, OK, great. You have your letters, you have your you know numbers and letters and whatever's. Now what? And if I didn't deeply understand 
the core of what they were going through and I didn't really deeply listen to the person and and the issues that they were struggling with, including my own self and my own core issues of my recurring patterns, you can't help anybody. So it's like, please don't unleash more people that know their type because then you ha you have to be the one to really genuinely walk them through the process of how to deal with all of this, you know? So yeah, <laughs> the more you own it, the more the more the hours you spend, the more you can get to the core of what's going on. Yeah. Yeah. It it really puts in like the saying, practice makes perfect. Right. So I was wondering, Shannon, yeah. what is the animals for someone new to the that's, theory? Uh, that's really good. Okay. So we called them the animals. It was like a nickname uh, when we first got started and it just stuck. I, I definitely knew at one point we were, I was like, we should probably change this. And like we attempted to, we like, you know, came up with different names on the whiteboard for a while. Cause I was like, we're going to have to communicate this. And it's just gonna be like, what's animals. But essentially I'll talk about the core and then I could talk about why we came to, to what they are. It's, it's just a observer and a decider working together to create an action. Now we didn't know that at first, the first thing we saw was we were actually watching um, chimp documentaries and we were kind of going through one of those processes where we were deeply studying just the core of human behavior. And early on, we locked on to the Punnett square of there's there's there always seems to be a pattern of four, a force, things come in fours. It was interesting. We actually found out later that Carl Jung came to the same conclusion. So I was like, okay, that makes, that's very interesting. That makes sense. Um, so we were seeing things in quadrants, seeing things in fours. And when you would find one, it would tell you that there's an opposite. And then it would also tell you that there's another opposite and it's opposite. So we were watching the chimps and going, okay, they are doing four core actions that they consistently revolve around every single day, all the time, all the time, all the time. And by the way, so are we. So, you know, if you were to watch kids playing at a playground, it was very easy to quickly be like, oh, they are doing these four actions. And when you're able to kind of step back from it, of course, because if you're looking at your own life, oh, my life is so complicated. It's more complicated than that. But when you're staring at a child, it's so much easier to see the, the simplification of what their life patterns actually are. And even more simplified when you're watching chimps. So you're like, okay, they are playing they're interacting, they're fighting, they're learning how to fight, they're learning how to wrestle. Okay, they are now sleeping. Everybody's taking a nap. Okay, so they're going, they're going and they're taking a nap, they're all sleeping. Okay, now they're all eating. That's all they're doing. They're consuming, they're consuming. And then there was this like other like category of like blasting. And it was just like, okay, we didn't see that one at first. We just knew there had to be a fourth. And we we're like, oh yeah, that does kind of account for what they're doing over here where they're all like, you know, kind of talking to each other, connecting to each other in this weird, interesting way. Um, that one came because we understood the other three. So it was like, okay, so there's a fourth here, what's going on there? Then once we saw those four reoccurring patterns, so we then started downloading more chimp documentaries and going, oh my God, I'm seeing it everywhere and seeing it in kids. Then we realized after going to the whiteboard for, you know, weeks and going, wow, this is actually connecting to the cognitive functions. And of course they're paired. So it was very, it was just, it was like, it was traumatizing. Cause of course that was another one of those times where you have to like sleep for a week straight because you're like, uh, brain is breaking, right? So the sleep energy, as you know, is the two introverted functions working together. So it's whether you have a introverted observer, which is either NI or SI and a introverted decider, which is either TI or FI. And when those two work together, they are consistently processing the known information of the person's inner perspective, inner world. And so that's what it's doing. And a lot of times you'll see that it, it takes the role of processing. It takes the role of being able to stop, preserve energy, go back over the self, go back over the known information and deeply own the person's own inner world. And then there's all the opposite of that. The binary coin of that is play. And those are the two extroverted functions, whether it is uh, and it's going to be DE, which is extroverted decider, either TE or FE, or it's OE, whether it's it, extroverted observer, whether it's NE or SE. And those take care of the action of dancing with the outside world, taking in the information and tossing the ball. It's kind of what we're doing right now. You know, you'll you'll talk and I take the information and I share it back with you. And then we ping off of each other for a bounce back. It's a, a tossing of a ball conversation, constantly wanting to 
give information to the other person and then learn information from the other person. So bounce back and forth. And a lot of times that takes the action for expending of energy, where if you need to jump over a fence, you need to jump in a car, you need to get out and run, you need to go. It's, it's, ex it's double extroverted. You're looking around and having to manage the constant newness, new things, which is the extroverted observer of the needs of the outside world, always scanning. And then the other two are a combination of the extrovert and introvert. So you have blast, which is very much your known information, your organized information, which will be again, either NI or SI, and then your extroverted decider. So you have either, either FE or TE. Those, the blast function is very much responsible for getting started, communicating, speaking, planning with the tribe. You and I have that last. <laughs> Like I, I know it seems like I'm communicating all the time, but a lot of times I'm communicating with play energy. It's like, it's very difficult for me to get started, like having to turn on the camera. I get the same nervous feelings of like, oh my God, just starting is a panic feeling. So yeah, blast. Most, like most teachers that you'll, that you'll see are going to be having blast high or blast as a savior, where they're just used to getting up, taking their information, giving their nuggets, their narrowed down information of truth to the tribe. That's what blast is responsible for. And then there's consume. That one's kind of easy. It's, it's, you know, people know a lot about consume. It's I take in new information for what I am interested in constantly. And so, and, you know, for those of us that have a savior, it becomes an addiction of wanting to constantly take in new, 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 inter interesting to the self information. It's not just new in general, it's new of what I want to know. <laughs> so that's it. Those are the animals. <laughs> that was beautifully explained. I, Thank I you. love your explanation. <laughs> Bravo. There's my and blast. Guess, yes, blaster speech done. I, I'd also <laughs> like to ask you about the modalities for like people okay. who don't know about it. <laughs> right. Okay. Very good. Okay. So the modalities, another thing that showed up last, and I was very much resistant to this one. I like you know, Dave, Dave early on was like, no, the modalities definitely matter. And I was like, no, I don't think so. Like I resisted for so long because I didn't, there wasn't an easy connection. It was not an easy connection. It was, it was a lot of layers deep that took, you know, hundreds of hours of processing to figure that one out. So, um, that one, it, it's, it's bizarre because it was like, I can see that you know, it was like comparing our business partner. I'll, I'll start with that story. Our business partner at the time was an INTJ, but he's a very different type of an INTJ than Dave. Dave is lead sleep. So he's NIFI, uh, blast, you know, sleep, that gives him sleep, sleep, blast, play. So he's just this like kind of rocket where he's like very, very sleep oriented, you know, all throughout his day, but he's constantly in like teacher mode, constantly wants to jump up and go to the whiteboard and teach everybody a lesson. Our other business manager, our other business partner was Lead Blast. So he was NITE. And so comparing the two of them was very fascinating. Now he was double feminine. He was the same exact type as Ty Lopez. So I was like, okay, Ty Lopez compared to Dave. And in real life, there's a lot of similarities, but like wildly different. And we were like, why are you wildly different? Because we're comparing NI. We're like, why? What is the pattern? Why are you guys different? And then also, I was Savior TE. That was very obvious that I was Savior TE. And why is my TE so different than our business partner's TE? That's what became, hold on a second. I am sharp. I am, I am a little too confident in my TE and our business partner was a lot more waffly. Like he would tell his ideas, but then he would bend, tell his ideas and then bend, tell us. And I'm like, Nope, it's this, it's, this is right. This is wrong. And I was so sharp. And so that also started like, okay, if you're this way, then what is your FI doing? And what is their FI doing? And then it became even more obvious that my FI was extremely like, movable, soft, very like, you know, like I could cry very quickly and, and, you know, neither Dave nor our business partner could because their, their FIs were masculine. And it was like, okay, now comparing those two, is this true? You know, we would, we would have so many theories. We'd have so many theories that would go up on the whiteboard and would die in a day, just 
you know, because you you just you take it and you smash it. OK, like throw a thousand of the people that we've typed in there and roll it through and see if we can start coming to the same conclusions. And then it would just it would fall apart, fall apart, fall apart. The thing that kept happening to us with the modalities at first is we kept trying. We're like, oh, maybe it's the extroverted decider and the extroverted observer. And so we thought that that's what it was. And we we're like, okay, so are, is your feminine this and your masculine this? And then wait, is it opposite? So if you have this, then you're automatically going to have a feminine that. And so the more we kind of process the whole information, we started coming to the conclusions like, okay, we started really seeing reoccurringly every function has a solid to it and then the opposite function has a movable to it and that was like that just started showing up everywhere it was just just it was like traumatizing how much that one became clear like you look at a tony robbins you're like why is tony robbins so different from let's say me you know because I'm, I'm i have the same saviors as him why why are we so different right so that started okay if that's what's going on if there's a solid to a function and then the other function is immovable you know now you're just talking about chemicals right um then we started realizing that there happens to be a connection between how the person is learning based on what is solid for them and what is movable for them so for me early on it was extremely obvious I, we were very aware that i was a visual and so i kind of became a non-movable sort of in the realm of like understanding the modalities we knew dave was the opposite of me somehow but he was more on the side of kinesthetic we just didn't understand it he was just very kinesthetic understood weight leverage heaviness of things was very aware of the kinesthetic side of learning so taking us into account and we started adding more people like okay so what is this person's modality and then trying to figure out and like working backwards from what is their modality? How do they primarily learn? And then can we actually see what their what their femininity, you know, their movable or their masculine non-movable functions are? And that's when the, you know, we just that's when it became such a, a, a you know, a Rolodex, like just trying trying different combinations. OK, what's going on here? What's going on here? And then eventually we realized that it was whatever the person's sensory was, which makes so much sense when you think about it now. At the time, I was like, ah, this is such an ugly pattern. It's not clean. It's like whatever the person's sensory was and oddly, whatever the person's extroverted decider was, which is not clean. It's very ugly. It's a very ugly, non, you know, non-pretty code. But when you think about it, the person's sensory, so they're picking up, this is how they're learning. They're either learning auditorily, they're learning visually, or they're learning in some kind of like kinesthetic or flow state. So for you, double feminine, you're like flow slash, yes, very much so, <laughs> flow slash visual. So it's like yeah. on that side of like being moved. And then the opposite side of that is the double masculine, which is just masculine sensory, masculine extroverted decider. They very much smash, smash. And they own, because they like push against the sensory, they seem to own the weight, the leverage, the heaviness of the physical universe. And because they're pushing on even the humans, it seems to be that's how they kind of, you know, interact with the world is I'm smashing against the what? The physical universe, things, sensory, and people. So you very quickly get a ping back of that is non-movable. That's not movable. This is heavy. This is light. This is easy to move. This is hard to move from the double masculine side. And then right in the middle, you get visual and then you get auditory, which is, it's bizarre to me that it works that way, but this is just the reoccurring pattern that we were seeing. We tested out the theory and then started seeing, can we actually see this happening by the thousands and when you know when dave and i would go and type we're like okay i'm actually seeing this your type the double feminine is the least that we understand because you know i'm visual dave's auditory and my son is double masculine so we we have a lot of time playing with those particular patterns and seeing them reoccurringly but like everybody always asks us like so what is it that double feminine does i'm like i don't no, so much. I just know that the, we can see them doing what they're doing. A lot of times it feels like smell, sense oriented, but I don't know a whole lot about it, you know? 
So <laughs> those are the modalities. <laughs> it's awesome. I it's like I'm so cryptic. <laughs> My <laughs> modalities, I love it. So you mentioned Tony Robbins earlier, and I was wondering if you could yeah. go a little bit into the human needs and how that correlates back to OP. <laughs> yeah, that's really good. So that was that was one of the first things that started us pulling apart the original stack. It was like, okay, it seems to be that, you know, when we would get stuck, we would kind of start looking for outside sources of people that were getting results in reality. Tony Robbins was one of the ones that we kept seeing having reoccurring results with getting like changes in the human behavior. Uh, Darren Brown is another one. We're like, why is it that Darren Brown is able to get consistent results even though they don't know the cognitive functions? Well, they know the functions, they just don't use the functions, you know? Because of course, all humans are going to be seeing the same patterns, but from different angles, calling them different things, you know? So we went back to Tony Robbins stuff again. We started studying his stuff again because we'd done it many years earlier. And he had, I think it's, six human needs. So he had its certainty, variety, significance, and validation, and then grow and give. And we we're like, okay, so <laughs> these two grow and give seem to be universal. Like that's what we were seeing. It wasn't type connected because grow self and then give to others. It seemed to be actually at the core of every single species that you would grow your own self, grow your mental muscles, grow your physical muscles, actually grow your phys you know yourself to survive and then spread the species, which is give give what you have received, give a beneficial adaptation, give to the next generation. That seemed to be extremely just almost evolutionarily reoccurring in our minds, you know. So that one we kind of put in a box and put over here, although that became like a cornerstone of our understanding of like, what do you even do with these functions? That became like our life source. Like, oh, wow, that really is at the core of meaning. But we still put it to the side so we can understand the other parts. Okay, so these are actually, again, in fours, oddly enough, you know, in the Punnett square. And it was so easy. It was like, oh, significance. That's easy. That's that's DI. Oh, uh, certainty. That's easy. That's he's talking about the O, I, the the introverted observer, whether that's NI or SI. Variety. That one's the easiest. You know, that's what the OEs want to do. The extroverted observers, the NEs or the SEs want variety. That's exactly what they're doing. Then there's the validation one, which is either FE or TE. That's also kind of that was an easy connection to see. So. With that, it's like, all right, because we're seeing everything coming in a preference based, it, there is a, there is this one is leading this one. Why? Why? What's the reason for that? In survival, you need somebody to have the authority to make the quick decision. Otherwise, you stay too long and you get killed by the lion, let's say, right? If you're in the middle of the forest, you need one observer and one decider to quickly have the authority to get moving so so you survive and it definitely you know we we were calling them we started calling them saviors and demons because after watching thousands of people we we're realizing that the way the human communicates about their two favorite functions is that i'm going to take these two tools and i'm going to go save the world with these two tools and that's how we actually see like the greatest thing ever is our saviors. I'm going to take my favorites and I'm going to go save the world. You all need my saviors. Let me just save the world with my saviors. So that's why we call them saviors. Demons, even like, and oddly enough, like we started really seeing people that would even talk about sightings of demons um, and, you know, kids crying in their bedrooms. That was a lot of what we were seeing early on on YouTube. We would watch all these videos and see people in their darkest states because we were kind of tracking their fears. So these kids crying in their bedrooms that would be talking about sightings of demons or fears of demons or fears of the darkness in their own selves, that we started recognizing very quickly was what people were seeing as their demon functions, like, or their, you know, the two functions that they don't use as much. It seems like we create in our minds a fear over it. It's scary. It's unknown. And therefore, we don't go and pursue it. We don't work on it. It's something that we shouldn't be responsible for. Oddly enough, we want to be seen 
as good at our demons. It's a fascinating little mechanism in our brain. Um, so that's why we started calling those uh, the demons. So now that you're seeing that there's a priority there, that there is a one above the other, I can use this one easily and I can work through all the problems with this one. This one's hard to use. I don't, I, I love it when it's easy. I love my demon functions when it's easy. As soon as there's a hard thing or a bridge to cross or a fence to jump over and it's too hard, I don't want to do it. <laughs> I just don't want to do it. I don't want to be responsible for it. And there becomes a lot of blame and I don't want to have to do it. So when we were seeing quickly is that if you have significance as your main responsibility, automatically you'll be spending all your time here. It's almost like a bank account. You'll be putting all your money into significance. And if I do enough significance, which is my saviors, if I put enough time into significance, then I will get validation from the tribe. And those were the binary coins, the DIs, whether it's TI or, or FI, will put all their bank account money, all their time, all the day long into that DI and then hope that that would overflow and spill enough and actually do enough to get validation from the tribe. And that was very clear. It was a very clear binary coin. And then we saw the opposite with the observers. If I do enough planning, if I overwork planning, if I overwork the understanding with NI, if I overwork my schedule, if I overwork, you know, just really over planning everything, then I will be able to dance in the moment. Then I will be able to deal with the chaos. Then I will be able to put every single chaotic thing that comes my way into my NI box or my SI box. Then I will be complete as long as everything I can control everything. And then the opposite is true for those that are variety seeking. If I just make sure I know all of the options. If I go gather every option out there, if I go gather, 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 automatically that somehow eliminates the perfect path because I will find the bestie, bestie, best, best, best one. And then I will know the path and then I will have it narrowed down. Oddly enough, of course, it doesn't do that. But the savior functions very clearly pointed us to we're doing, we're overdoing one and underdoing the other. And we saw very quickly that what Tony Robbins was seeing was that you have a priority and then mess up the other one. And because we started connecting them to the functions, we realized very quickly that you can jump your second function, which if you look at it, it makes a lot of sense. We actually, for a while, we're like, oh, can you jump your first function? Like we thought maybe you might be able to jump your first function. Realized that that wasn't the case, that you were always going to have that first function as your savior. Automatically, that's always going to be a savior. And then because your first function is either an observer or a decider, you will then your brain wiring, you know, whether you're this type or that type will choose its second partner. So whichever, so like say you're a lead observer, you're going to choose, your brain does by default in the genetics, chooses, I either want this observer, which is the second one, or I want this observer, which is the third one, and it pairs those. And when you have your first and third, like both you and I do, it, we just call it jumpers. You jump it, you know, and that's just a weird anomaly in the code. Um, but it's fascinating how you see it everywhere. <laughs> it explains a lot for those of us that are jumpers, you know, we don't exist in Myers-Briggs. So yeah, it really does. I feel like it's a really big contribution to type to right. introduce the term jumpers, right? Because it's so revolutionary, but it's so, so true. And so that brings me to my next question. What is a glass lizard? <laughs> <laughs> that's a good one. That's, that's, that analogy came from Dave. Um, that was a good one. Yeah. So glass lizard, let me just define the term. What the hell is a glass lizard? So it's a lizard that looks like a snake because it doesn't have arm. It doesn't have legs, but it has the vertebra of, of a lizard. So it's technically it's, you know, qualified as a lizard even though it looks like a snake. So it's a very confusing animal because you're like, oh, it's a snake. It's, no, no, it just looks like a, it looks like an alligator lizard without legs. And he uses that analogy perfectly. I love the analogy because it, it very clearly explains, you know, you're an INFJ. So why do you look like an INTP and a, you know, like what is going on there? Why are you so activate or, or even an ISTP technically, you know, with your, your SE at the bottom? What is happening there? And same thing with me. I'm an ENTJ. So why is it that I'm not? I hate controlling the tribe. I hate 
teaching the tribe. I don't want to manage anyone. <laughs> well, that's not correct. You know, like I don't get it. I don't, that, that doesn't fit in with the Myers-Briggs profiles. An ENTJ is supposed to be the commander. I don't want to command no one. You know, <laughs> I look more like, technically I would look more like an ESFP or an ESTP, you know, because I have the jumpers and then double activating that last one. And same thing with you. You're going to see much more INTP like almost, you know, and it, what basically happens is you get, you get all four animals, you get all four of them. You get your first one by default that comes because of your saviors. So your saviors automatically give you that very lead animal. So for you, you're going to be lead sleep because you're NITI. And that's the two introverted functions. They work together to create sleep. And so you get that one for free. That's your saviors. Me, I'm lead play. Yes, yes, I got one for free. <laughs> <laughs> right. I'm, I'm lead play. I have two extroverted functions. So that one you get for free. But what happens is for someone like you, when you go to sleep and immediately go to consume, you're not supposed to activate SE, but for you, your consume is SE and TI. And so automatically your second, your second savior animal, you get two savior animals, two demon animals. So you're going to want to work two animals together. So it's like four combination of functions. I know it's strange, but this is how the parts all lay out. You're going to be overworking that SE at the bottom, which normally you shouldn't be doing. Shouldn't, 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 shouldn't be doing, right? And the same thing with me. I have, I have consumed second as well. And so I'm automatically reaching down to my FI, pulling it up and going, what do I like? What do I like? What do I like all the time? So by being sleep consume, you're breaking the mold. You're not supposed to do that as an INFJ, right? You're supposed to be lead blast as an INFJ, but you're skipping that and then you're grabbing up your consume. So automatically you're activating your SE and then your play third. So like now you're activating your SE again. And that, then, then that's when you tap into your FE. And so that's what's so fascinating is like, okay, so you didn't tap into your FE until you hit a demon function as an INFJ. That's super fascinating. What's going on there? Why do you have all that activation on that SE at the bottom? And so that's where like all of these parts, you know, that's, that's basically all the way down to, to 512. And then of course the modalities, all of these parts started revealing themselves over the years. And it's just, it, it's like, if you start at 512, you're like, what a mess. <laughs> like, what is going on here? Why do they have three animals? What are the animals? Why are they connected? And it, it was just, it was like, we, we pulled at the thread of a sweater and just kept pulling. And then the sweater just kept unraveling. And all of these parts started perfectly, beautifully laying themselves out. And what ends up happening with the code all the way down is you get a beautiful, it's honestly beautiful. It's a beautiful like display of very, very simple parts. Just this, just four, you know, just, it's just very simple or like these four connected to these four, you got the human needs and you got the letters and you smack those together and you get functions. And then you smack those together and you get animals and you smack those together and you get somebody's type. And then you smash modalities on top of them. And that is what creates the variety of our species, which is so, so beautiful to me. But of course, with that variety, there comes contradictions. And for you and I, we are contradictions. It's like having that much activation on your last function is a contradiction for, I have a desire to create order. You have a beautiful desire to create order with your NI, but then having the double activation on that SE, you're going to keep consuming and keep bringing in new information, even though your mind wants order. So every new thing that you're bringing in, it's going to be draining because you're going to still have to put it into your NI box of order. And same thing with me. I'm not allowed to use all that FI, but I'm like, I like this, I like this, I like this, I like this. And it creates um, the contradictions of, I have all this FI love, but I'm not allowed to because I still have to make the tribe happy, do things for the tribe. So it creates a conflict, a very conscious conflict because, because I'm staring at that last function all the time, just like you are, there's a desire for that. And I'm using it all the time, 
but it conflicts with that first function. And that's what ends up causing a lot of like, I don't know, anxiety and drain. It just causes a lot of conscious drain, but it does feel like your type and my type have less giant blowups later in life because we're very aware of that demon function, just staring at it going, oh, I got to be responsible for that, you know? So positives and negatives, you know? <laughs> <laughs> it's almost like we're more balanced because we naturally right. focus on our demons. Right. But the trade-off is that we look really atypical. I just love all of the complexity in your system with the 512 because it allows for the flavors within a type. Right. Because it allows for dimensionality because right. by these different, like the animals and the modalities, you create a dimension in a yeah. person's archetype. And I love right. that. Right. And so that brings me to my next question for you. As a glass lizard and as an ENTJ, how do you yeah. think that makes you different from the normal, typical ENTJ? <laughs> yeah, I, I see the normal ENTJ, which is, it's, I guess you could say the very, very typical ENTJ would be blast. I feel like most of them would be like blast, play, sleep. That's the archetypal, you know, ENTJ, it seems like. It seems like that's the one, if you were to write a profile about them, that's what. So it's like literally like almost exactly my opposite, which is funny because that's what my dad is. So my dad is the like most typical ENTJ you could get. And gosh, it's, it feels, it's weird because obviously we have the same like lead function and demon function. So I'm still going to play the same, you know, TE game of like, let's bang the blocks together. Let's bang on the heads of the tribe to figure out things logically and how does it work for them and them and them. So we'll do the same things as far as that. It's just, if you followed around me all day, I would be quiet 90% of the day. I don't like to talk. I don't like to share. I'm very, very quiet. Most of the time I have an extremely stoic look on my face and I get, I get exhausted very, 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 very quickly. I get very, very tired. I get very drained very quickly. Whereas the other type, like they're just going, they're doing things, they're planning things, producing, like that's a big thing that you see for a lot of the EJs or ENTJs, producing, like making things uh, happen, you know, getting stuff out there. They're the ones that are like directors, directing things and making things things go, you know, typical, you get the, the blow horn kind of feel. Um, so if you were to put us in a room, the, the, the biggest difference you would see is energy. It's not that I can't blast. It's not that I can't control the tribe. Obviously, I do it in a demon state. I will I will do the like disciplinary in a demon state. I'll be like, okay, that was enough. That was five minutes and I'm out. You know? <laughs> not that great of a communicator around our house at all. But um, energy feels like the biggest difference. So it's like I still have the same human need to de desire um, as far as wanting the logic, all of those sorts of things. And then I, I guess the second thing, absolutely, I do not have strong NI. My NI is, it's not that I can't um, simulate. I absolutely can simulate. I absolutely can abstract that I don't have problems with the actual letter, but planning, planning, organizing, and narrowing down. It's just very, very difficult because my brain is automatically always on the Rolodex new, 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 more, new, more, new, more, new all the time. So that's, that's another big difference. And I think that that's kind of what you would see for your own self as well. Like put you in an INFJ in a room that's, let's say a blast play sleep INFJ, which would be like the typical INFJ. And just night and day, you would just quickly be like, well, one's FE and, and one's TI. So like, the massive difference and then one is just constantly talking and performing and dancing and wanting to and then the other one is just like let's be calm let's learn let's take in like you know your energy versus somebody who's like up there producing would be so 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 different yeah it's so true yeah i find myself to be more of the intellectual cerebral side of the yeah. infj yeah big time big time yeah i i like and that's where you're like okay well which which Myers-Briggs profile would that be? Like, I don't, would you maybe be a, like, I would say like INTP, you could smash INFJ in there for sure. But like, yeah, cerebral. Yeah. Yeah, that's so <laughs> cool. And, the, <laughs> and that brings us to our next question. So Shannon, yes. <laughs> what are three words you'd use to describe yourself? And what are three words other people would describe you as? <laughs> that's so fun. 
Okay, so I'm such a weirdo decider. Let's see if I can manage this without laughing the whole time. Okay. <laughs> okay, let me start. See, I don't even know what I would describe myself. I know the tribe's perspective. See, there's DE for you. Okay. <laughs> I could tell you what Dave would describe me as. He would describe me as, well, see, of course, I'm like going straight for the negative. It would be like like T-Rex. I think that would be number one, T-Rex. <laughs> <laughs> or or Velociraptor. I think that would be number one. Um, gosh, I can't even think of anything else. <laughs> what a freaking single decider. Okay. How would I describe myself? Belligerent. But loving. And determined. Belligerent. Loving. Determined. I bet you Dave would say the same thing about me, belligerent and loving and determined. <laughs> yeah, he calls me a, a fighter, which is what he loves about me. Just focused and determined. Yeah, which is where wow. the T-Rex comes from. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, T-Rex is the one that encapsulates those three. <laughs> That's beautiful. <laughs> One word for Shannon. Lovable T-Rex. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> Do you have three? Do you have yours? Wow. <laughs> I did not think of this. Wow, the tables have turned. <laughs> I hard. see myself as really introspective, insightful, and like an old man. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. I love that. It's oh my like, god, I love that. I'm so sleep that yeah. I, I'm so serious about my sleep processing and digesting all that I know. Right. I feel kind of like a wrinkly old man in a living. <laughs> <laughs> you, you're already living in the future like 20 years. Yeah. <laughs> processing everything out. How does this go? Where does this go? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So oh, I relate I love to that. the <laughs> yeah, so I relate to the stereotype of old soul. Old um, soul, big time. Yeah, yeah that's so Too good. Too old. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. So my next question for you, Shannon, would be, what advice would you give to blast lasters such as me and you? <laughs> yeah. Oh my gosh. Okay, so what you're doing right now is perfect. Like by having this, like, you know, I have to get on, I have to do videos, I have to actually teach and talk with people there. It's genius because it's forcing you to play the, the repetition game. So you're speaking with the tribe and you have to have your organized information to then deliver to the tribe. So automatically, if you can put yourself into some kind of racket where you're forced to get out there, it's brilliant. It's forced practice. So that's like number one. The second thing that I would say I learned, I learned this from Dave and I learned this from um, Jerry Seinfeld. He said, uh, like, I think it was literally just said, like, louder, faster, like jokes are the funnier they are. It's the louder and the faster they are. So I have such a hard time speaking with the words connected to each other. And so like, if I don't know ahead of time, my A and then my my B, I will just go off into outer space. I will talk into outer space. So I have to be very, very careful that I always know the, the premise that I'm speaking on and then the conclusion that I'm heading towards. Therefore, the middle can get a little messy, but if I don't know the A to B, I really, really, really get lost. Therefore, I'm allowed to speak faster and um, literally, I'm like stumbling as I'm saying this, faster and, and louder. So that's been a real, like you will notice, I'm sure you've probably seen the videos of me speaking from the very beginning, either, either in our class or in the, in the beginning of our YouTube shows. And now where I'm like, just talking as fast as I humanly can to try and get the information out there so that there's not a lot of breaking of space. Cause that's where you can tell the blast last is they'll say something, wait a few seconds and then say something else, wait a few seconds. And so there's always the chop and it's like, we're pausing because we're trying to go back into our world and get the consume. Like I knew I had this in here somewhere. I knew I had the information in my brain somewhere. Where was it? And then, you know, of course, feminine sensory, I forgot. <laughs> so it's helpful to know A to B and then also to speak as fast as you can. And that's like, what are you practicing? What are you practicing when you're alone by yourself or even on these videos? It's, I gotta have an A to B, so I have a point. 
and then I have to speak it faster and louder. And then at the bottom of all of this, always, always, always come from a place of authenticity. You have to be able to come from a place where you are are finding a way to share your emotion, which is very, very difficult for somebody like you and I. It's very, very difficult for me to share my laughter, share my annoyance, share my anger, share my irritation. All of those things make me very nervous to share with other people, especially me being FI, because if they don't like me in an angry state, then they don't like me. So that's been something that when I go to practice, I have to choose to share emotion in my faster, louder. So therefore, I'm coming up with things like I have to tell a story sometimes, and it has to be a personal story. And this is where I, I am coming from. Here's what I would do if I were you. So whenever I'm telling, whenever I'm teaching, I'm trying to make sure that it's never directional, like, you know, the straight blaster finger at the person, because that's so like, why are you telling me what to do? You know, I want to come from a place of here is advice that I am sharing with the tribe but I first did it myself and I first did it on myself and I first tried it on myself. So every time my B is advice, my A to B, my B is advice, but it's coming from a place of, I already used this, I tried this, this is what worked for me, let me share a personal story from my own life. But again, all of this falls apart if you're not practicing because even getting to the place where you're able to do it faster, louder and sharing, if you're not in a situation like you are right now, brilliant, by the way, like you're doing everything right, like this is genius. If you're doing what you're doing, you will get there over time. Look at my, you know, past, like I just was fumbly talk all the time. Dave edits the videos, so you can't tell when I'm fumbling, you know, but I've gotten better. So there's less editing over time. So yeah, also edit your stuff. <laughs> <laughs> the moral of the story, exposure therapy. Yes, you very good. Yourself. <laughs> Thank you, know, you. You get used to it and you get better. Yes. You just put yeah. yourself in the rink and, like, and you fight it out. That's it. <laughs> That's the NI. Yeah. Fight out Thank your you. <laughs> Absolutely. Put yourself out there. If you're not the one in the arena, you never get to grow the muscles. That's really yeah. it. Yeah, absolutely. Like I'll even practice by doing like, audios like somebody somebody will email email us or something like that and I feel like oh this is a good one that I could do like a five minute audio on and I push myself to do these little audios all the time and then while I'm doing it I'm like take five takes if you need to but get it in five minutes and say it fast say it loud and say it with beautiful emotion yeah that's such a beautiful outline for how to become better at speaking. <laughs> right. <laughs> I learned a lot from Dave. Dave's got all that good, you know, NF blast. <laughs> he really does. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so Shannon, what is the magical key for unlocking deep potential hidden within you? <laughs> That's a really, really good question. Um, honestly, the biggest thing that we have been studying lately uh, is the hero's journey stuff which just basically is what is the process? What is the journey from a person going to the natural default wiring addictions of the saviors all the way to the other side of consciousness and responsibility? So that whole like journey, it seems like randomly, sporadically, you know, one person will make it out because they put themselves in a situation where their savior functions were causing them so much trauma in the real world that they couldn't keep surviving being addicted to their saviors. And honestly, the biggest thing, so consciousness and responsibility, the biggest, largest, oh my God, unlock is can you see yourself? Can you see the saviors causing the reoccurring problems every five, five minutes? Like, can you actually see that your saviors are either getting triggered uh, or your demons are getting triggered every five minutes. You're, you're like putting information into this bank account of I'm doing my saviors. I'm overdoing my saviors. I'm not processing or I'm not doing my demons. Therefore in two weeks or whatever time it is, you will have the blowups and you will always be able to at those two weeks time or Maybe it's seven days for you. Maybe it's three days for you. Maybe it's three months for you. A lot of times I think it happens even when people are not conscious that it's happening because a lot of a lot of what our brains are able to do is instantly blame and therefore send the pressure out into this thing 
it was this thing's fault or this person's fault so quickly. And it's it's the the way to unlock all of the potential for the self because you'll do all kinds of building. You'll build up with your saviors. You'll touch the rim of I can do amazing things with my saviors all the time. People do it all the time. It's not what can you do. It's not what can you do once. It's not what can your saviors do. It's what can you scalably do. And 99.9% 110% of the time, you'll be building something up beautifully and you'll knock it down every seven days, every two weeks, whatever it is, you'll knock it down because we are very, 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 very unself aware of how much trauma our saviors are causing in our life because we're just putting in that time all the time and then missing, missing the rest of the buckets. Let's say every function is a bucket. All eight functions are a bucket that need to get filled up but we're obsessively staring at just two buckets and all day long, every five minutes we're putting in, we're putting in what needs to get put into the two savior buckets, ignoring the rest. And when we have that blow up, our brains are quickly able to go. It was that thing or that person and then go unconscious. And then we just do it again. You just get right back on the hamster wheel and you do it again. And the only way to really break free of that whole process, first of all, you have to see self. And in my opinion, and we'll probably be talking about this more and more and more and more over time, you have to get partners. You have to get a team of people. You have to start triangulating. I would not make it if it weren't for Dave and Dave would not make it if it weren't for me. And our whole goal, like our largest goal in order to get op out there is to get a team of people here to save us from ourselves. Because I know how bad I am every five minutes. And that that every five minutes, if I'm not tracking that every five minutes, in two weeks from now, I don't care how great the code is. I don't have I don't care how great op is. All these discoveries will be washed away completely. If I am not the one that is going, I have to solve the problem of me. And the more I get conscious of how bad I really am, the more I then become responsible. And now I'm looking for, okay, I got to get a team of people to track me. I got to get a team of people to help track you. And that's our number one goal. That's what we're really seeing in the root of all of this is the way to really unlock that is to actually be able to reoccurringly see self. That's what consciousness is, to be able to really see yourself by triangulation. It's like you need to see yourself to save yourself. Yes. Because we are actually victims, not not to just the world, but to ourselves and our own perception of things. Very so much. when we're able to know when we're the ones causing the cycles, when we're the, we're the ones causing these, you call it the tidal waves, right. then we have power right. in taking hold of our fate right. and changing it. It's right. like changing our destiny through awareness and consciousness. That's exactly <laughs> it. That's exactly it. That's our whole, that's what we spend our life on. That right there, that little NI nugget. It's our whole life. That's what all this stuff brought about. Like, you know, we started seeing all these reoccurring problems and started realizing how much was actually attached to our obsession with our saviors. Just, well, if I can see it in everybody else, guess what that means, you know? Yeah, our saviors are kind of like our band-aid solution to life's problems, Completely. but they don't always work, work, so you're left there bleeding and bleeding and bleeding, and you realize that maybe if these band-aids aren't working, you have to go somewhere else, and you have to oh. figure out how to solve this outside of your saviors, but that's hard because your saviors are your point of comfortability, and it's hard to get yeah. out of your comfort zone because out of your comfort zone feels like death. Yes. Like your nervous system your nervous system is wired to believe that you're going to die if you go outside of your comfort zone because it's unknown and that's scary. So, and much. so yeah. And so lovely said, Shannon, that mm -hmm. to, to save yourself is to see yourself and then to basically see that you're the one getting in your own way. Right. And that if you were to get that out, then so many things in your life would be smoother. Right. Right. And it's so freeing when you can see it from a growth mindset perspective. It's honestly the most freeing thing in the world, because the first thought is like, well, that's scary. I don't want everything in my life to be my fault, my responsibility. But then when you really look at it, you're like, well, wait a minute. If every single thing is on your shoulders, that means that you can change it. 
you can get free. So it's great. I love that I'm the one messing up my own life. <laughs> <laughs> That's very important. I can fix that. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It's like people don't realize how much power they have over the things they can't control. It's right. just that when there's a little bit out of control, they assume that a lot of other things are out of control when there is elements that they yeah. control, but they give okay. up full power to the world because there are slight elements that they aren't able to get a hold of. So it's like this human nature to like learned helplessness almost. It's like, if I can't have control over the small aspect of my life, it bleeds over and I feel like I can't control anything and that it, people have way more learned helplessness than they think. And I feel like going right. to your saviors is actually a symptom of deep within learned helplessness that the only thing that will work is your saviors and that anything outside of that is, is a little bit like an area of insecurity. Completely. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry, that was a little meta. <laughs> no, that was dead on. That was so good. That's exactly what we're seeing. That is exactly it. You, you mm -hmm. have so much power, but your mind will stack the fears of your saviors. If you don't have control in this area, maybe you don't have control in this area, maybe you don't have control here, and it starts stacking the saviors. It absolutely will build all of these observations of fear because this area isn't going well. When, if you step back and, and go, wait a minute, I'm supposed to be scared of that. I'm supposed to think that the world is full of chaos and full of, you know, anxiety that wants to stop the areas that I do have control over. And the more that I let that be at peace, the more that I get access to my whole brain instead of the one side of my brain that I love the most. Therefore, I'm never stuck because you'll never, ever, ever be stuck if you're allowed to use all four of your functions. But our brains believe that we're stuck because it, we're, we're not allowed to use our demons. And so when we get in a bind, because we're trying to only use our saviors, which maybe our saviors don't work here, that's when we panic. That's when the anxiety comes. That's when the tidal waves come. There comes a massive overdose of anxiety because I'm trying to only use my saviors here. If I know that I'm doing that every five minutes and not just at the big giant blow up, I now can practice going, all I'm going to want to do all day is every five minutes only use my saviors. I'm going to start catching myself and go, how am I doing this every five minutes? Because if I can catch myself every five minutes, that two week or that one month or that seven day blow up doesn't happen to me because I'm tracking you before I get there. So I don't have to feel stuck. I can start practicing every five minutes to let go of the fear of, of chaos, to let go of the fear of not being in control, to let go of the fear of that powerlessness. Because I know I could just use that other function. It's going to feel weird. It's going to feel like standing on my hands, but I'm not stuck. I'm not stuck. That's a wonderful message, Shannon. And I would say for all you visuals out there, I'll give you a visual metaphor of what she just said. Love it. So you have a nail and you have a piece of wood. And so you have a toolbox, which is your saviors and demons. So you realize that your screwdriver is your savior, right? So you're trying to nail down a nail on a plank of wood using a screwdriver because that's your savior and that's how you solve problems. And while, meanwhile, there's a hammer in your toolbox too. And now you're frustrated and you're like, you're all defeated because you're like, the screwdriver isn't working. I'm like, <laughs> on the nail? It's it's so and then you realize like, hey, there's also a hammer in my toolbox. <laughs> it was within my control to maybe like use this. And then you use it and you're like, one try. Right. So <laughs> that is so good. Because like in, in exactly going off of your analogy there, like we feel comfortable with the screwdriver and we don't feel comfortable with our skills with our hammer because we don't often pick it up. And so it's like, mm -hmm. no, I know that won't work. I've tried that before. I don't do well with a hammer. And that's where our brain will just stop. It like won't let us go any further. And the more that we just know that process, the more that we're conscious that our brain is going to tell us lies like that, the more that we can actually practice, the more that we can be free. So I love, I love that analogy. That's so good. Thank you. <laughs> I love talking to you, Shannon. It was like a pleasure. Yeah. <laughs> Objective personality. It was linked below. It is full of awesomeness um, and wonderful people such as Shan and Dave. So I mm -hmm. highly recommend you check it out in the links below. They are really onto something and they're really going to further typology. So, you know, keep up with them. They're going <laughs> to bring it to science or bring something very special to type. So like, thank you, Shannon, for mm -hmm. your contribution to typology. 
there's this saying that we stand on the shoulders of giants, I think it's that's how it, it's said, but it's almost like, like, thank you for furthering type and helping mm. us with bringing credibility to it, like bringing mm. all of this, like wonderfulness to type, like, I deeply, deeply appreciate all the work you do. And thank you so much for taking the time to come on this humble little show called Oh, God, thank you so much for having me. I just I adore you. I think you're so smart. I think you're so kind. And I love your show. I love what you're doing. And I was excited. I was really excited to get to come on. So thanks for having me. (laughs) I'm so excited that you were so excited. (laughs) And the excitement (laughs) going on each other. (laughs) And thank you, viewers, for like watching this far. You are a champ. You are amazing. (laughs) For your your attention span is out of this world. That's yeah, so check cool. out OP if you guys have free time, uh, and their links are below. They have classes, and they have awesome stuff coming up, like up ahead in the future too. So you know, <laughs> if your NI is looking forward to the future, <laughs> then I look forward to the future of OP. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you, Joyce. That's so great. It was a pleasure to talk to you. Thank you so <laughs> much. Bye, guys. Bye. <laughs> Bye. <laughs>